This afternoon I am in Sarasota, Florida, enjoying the warm weather and speaking with Jane L. Hammond. Jane is the Edward Cornell Librarian Emeritus and Professor Emeritus of Law at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. She is also a past president of the American Association of Law Libraries. Jane, it is our custom to begin these conversations by asking you a little information about uh, yourself uh, uh, as an individual or, or person. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your life, perhaps not only today, but also when you were younger? Well, I was born and raised on a farm in Iowa that uh, we raised corn, as you would expect in Iowa, but my father's great joy was uh, feeding prime beef, and uh, we had lots of very good beef when we were growing up. And uh, from there I went on to uh, the University of Dubuque to get my bachelor's degree, and right after that I went to library school at Columbia because uh, I didn't want my father to find out that you couldn't get a job with a liberal arts degree. <laughs> and uh, so that was the, uh, the way it started. Mm -hmm. So you have a degree in liberal arts and, mm -hmm. and uh, the employment prospects were not as uh, grand as they might have been in some other fields at that time, huh? Well, and there were, at that time, there were very few fields open for women, mm -hmm. particularly if you were out in, in Iowa. You, you were a teacher, you were a nurse, or you were somebody's secretary, mm -hmm. and, uh, or so, you got married. Yeah, so you decided to become a librarian. Huh? That's why I became a librarian. Okay. Again. Well, with that in mind, um, before we proceed to talk about your career, which I know is extensive and interesting. Um, could I ask you, if you have, now that you're retired and here in Sarasota, do you have any particular hobbies or passions or oh. other activities that you'd like to mention? Well, I, uh, one of the things that I did almost all of my life was play the piano. Unfortunately, the arthritis started in my hands and I had to give that up because I couldn't play as well to suit myself anymore. Mm -hmm. But I still attend a lots of classical concerts. It's one of the reasons I moved to Sarasota, because Sarasota has a lot of very fine classical music. Oh. And so, uh, which I enjoy and which I attend regularly. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is I do a lot of handwork, needlework, embroidery, uh, I don't do much knitting anymore, but I do embroidery work. Mm -hmm. And I've met some nice people through the embroidery guild here. It's always nice. And they must have similar interests if yeah. they uh, self-select to be in that same yeah, that's organization. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's nice. Well, let's talk about uh, your career. As I recall, you uh, started where many of us in our profession would say sort of one of the top places, uh, Harvard, at the yeah. Law School Library. Could you tell us about uh, some about that job? Well, hiring in those days was a lot different than it is now. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I was working, well, I was taking courses at Columbia. I worked part-time in the New York Public Library. And um, as I was getting towards the end of my degree program, I was at work one afternoon and I got a call from Arthur Pulling, who was the director of the law library at Harvard, and who was looking for a cataloger. So he called, he talked to me one afternoon. He called two weeks later and offered me the job. <laughs> and I still don't remember why I wasn't anxious beyond belief because this was just about two weeks before the f I was ready to graduate. And mm -hmm. why I wasn't torn apart by the fact that I didn't have a job, I didn't understand. But maybe it was just because I was young. And so I left, uh, got on the train and went to Boston and worked as a cataloger there for two years. Mm -hmm. I um, started out doing pretty much every language in the collection. At that point, Harvard had a standing order for every law book in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
so I was doing a lot of that, and then the woman who had been doing the English cataloging left, and then I took over and did the English cataloging. Um, that was before we had classification, so all you had to do was catalog the book and not worry about the classification there. Mm -hmm. And um, but the sort of the procedure at that time was that you did your first job for a couple of years, and then you start looking for something else. And so it's and then my boss was young and liked her job and. She was going to stay there, and she did. She stayed till she retired. So, so her job was not readily going to be available. Her job, no. The Moody sisters were technical services at Harvard for years and years. Oh, this was one of the Moody. It was one of the Moody sisters. Oh yeah, Harvard, they, Moody they were there until they retired, so it was always. Yeah, and so uh, after I was looking for another job, in the meantime, Arthur Pulling, who had hired me in the first place had retired from Harvard because of age. As, as he said, if they didn't let Conant stay past 66, they weren't going to let him. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he had moved on to a place I'd never heard of called Villanova to start oh. the law library there mm -hmm. uh, because they had just started their law school. And he went the year that the, they started. And I. Uh, he offered me the job to come down and be the assistant librarian, and I asked him what that meant, and I said, well, anybody we hire after you will be, low, be below you. <laughs> and there were just the two of us when we started out. So I... You should have insisted that he be call you the librarian then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was... Uh, so I went down, and um, there were the two of us. I did all of the technical services. Mm -hmm. You know, I checked things in. I cataloged them. They just some and we sort of split the duties of supervising the students who were around. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I went down there and worked with him until uh, he retired from uh, Villanova. The, um, and then I became the director. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, when I went down there, I said I didn't want to have to compete with these lawyers who didn't want to be lawyers. And oh, you don't have to do that. I don't have a law degree. So and so doesn't. So and so. Well, I hadn't been in the business very long before I discovered that the people he had mentioned were anomalies. That it was. Particularly after World War II, having double degrees was becoming more and more prerequisite for advancement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I went, started going to law school part time. I took uh, one course, one course or two, I think just one per semester. Uh, so it took me several years mm -hmm. to. Uh, finished the degree. I was very fortunate. Villanova never charged me a cent for tuition. So it cost me nothing. I went in a, earlier in the morning and made up some of the time. And then I took mm -hmm. two summers off and went to summer school at uh, Northwestern in Wisconsin because that I could go see my family in Iowa as part of that. And that uh, speeded up the process a little bit. And then when I finally finished, I uh, took the bar exam and became a member of the Pennsylvania Bar. Mm -hmm. Never practiced, never wanted to practice. I was just very happy being a librarian. Mm -hmm. So that was um, where So I was. You, you were at Villanova for a number of years, uh, pulling, pulling. Mm -hmm. re retired along there. Now you were the head librarian then. then. Was it before you got the law degree that you were the director, or um, as they call them in today, and director, associate dean? Director. You would have been the law librarian or librarian. I um, no, I had the degree before he left. Okay. And um, yep, I'm, I've, I did have. I had the degree because then I. Uh, could become, uh, got the t 
title of professor along with it. All right. And uh, when I had stayed with that. Mm -hmm. And I was at Villanova until 1977, I think. 76, fall of 76. 76, bicentennial year. Yeah, yeah. well that was, mm -hmm. I moved the year after I was president, of, immediately after I was president of the Law Library Association. Yeah. And so, Morris Cohen, uh, may he rest in peace, was uh, said that he had moved from Penn to Yale, right after he was president, it was a mistake that I should take some time off. <laughs> and relax. <laughs> so I did. I took a, a whole month off uh -huh. between the two jobs and went to, uh, well, I went down to the Jersey Shore and just really got away from everything for, mm -hmm. for a period of time, mm -hmm. which meant that I didn't get to Cornell until the 1st of October. Yeah. I suspect... Uh... Cohen had a little bit longer time in mind for this time <laughs> off to relax business. Well, I no, I think you know a month was within range, but he he had nothing. He just yeah. went directly from one job, from being president, and moved into the, the, the went, moved to Yale. And, uh, well, you know, for today's law librarians who look at headquarters with the staff of professionals to do an awful lot of the things, in your day and Morris's, you didn't have the luxury of this staff. Uh, oh. You had the executive secretary? Or was that, that beyond when you were there too? Uh, that happened while I was, I became secretary of the Law Library Association mm -hmm. early in my career. And I was secretary for five years. That doesn't happen anymore. No. But in the course of those, um, or about the time that I became secretary, the association decided to open an office in um, Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I know that was there because when I first went in, I bought an electric typewriter because I had to type um, enough copies of the minutes for everybody on the executive board. And you could only do that with an electric typewriter. Mm -hmm. Copy machines weren't around at that point yet. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> to say nothing of computers. <laughs> oh dear, no. Uh, so. Uh, then they, they opened the office in Chicago, and I didn't have to do that anymore. The uh, such production matters went and were done by Babe Russo at Chicago. Mm -hmm. I remember going to the AALS meeting. I guess the year that I was going in, and I shared a taxi with Harry Bittner, who had been my predecessor at Cornell. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we've, we're opening the uh, office and we've got a balanced budget. And he was, he was very pleased to hear that. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> that was very nice. Yeah. He also, uh, Harry was a president of ELO. Oh, yes, recall, Harry. Had, years before. Yes, Harry had been president. And, um, to say nothing, he'd be the author of the Price and Bittner um, uh, book on legal research and writing. Right. Bibliography. And uh, almost required to use that in the, the legal research courses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember relying on it heavily when I was a student uh, in a yeah. program in Seattle that Marion Gallagher had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you were uh, actually at Cornell, uh, I guess, about 10 years then after you got your law degree, and then you yeah. went to, uh, or not Cornell. Uh, you went to Cornell about 10 years after uh, you got your law degree at yes. Villanova. And you were there until you retired in 1993. Mm -hmm. Before we talk about some more of your involvement in the association and profession, uh, could we talk a little bit more about what you did and how the, what that job was all about in those days uh, at uh, Cornell? At, at Cornell? Mm -hmm. uh, when I went there, um, Lexus was very new. Mm -hmm. We had one terminal. It was about the size of a roll-top desk. Oh, I remember those things. <laughs> and uh, the, the students, of course, at that point did not have computers. They were, they were, this was new to them as well. Yeah. And uh, Boolean logic was something that they had not heard of. And uh, mm. of course, now you don't use it either because the search engines are so much better, but yeah. uh, in those days, 
he really did have to use but not and just the other connectors too. Yeah, and you had to be able to spell things exactly the way, yeah. right or wrong, that it was spelled in the database too. Yes, and I know they still say, tell anybody that it's, it's, it's fine if you want to find something very specific, but if you want to find something on the Fifth Amendment, the computer is not going to help you at mm -hmm. all. It's, there, there's too much. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but it uh, certainly did change the way everybody does has done business and the a very nice smooth idea in marketing was that Lexus uh, gave great discounts to law schools so that the mm -hmm. students got hooked and went out and were very adamant about having it in the firms when they moved out. When Westlaw came along, uh, that company had to offer the same sorts of discounts mm -hmm. uh, to the academic community. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and I remember I was president when uh, Westlaw just came out, and I got a call from Lindbergh, and uh, you know what what the, should they do? How should they promote this? And I suggested that maybe they should have a booth at the in the exhibit area. Uh, which hadn't occurred to them, mm -hmm. or nearly as I could tell. And so they started with a little booth, and of course by the time we got through, they had <laughs> very extensive uh, setup and professional uh, programs for Westlaw at the conventions. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. well, he was the first, he was in charge of Westlaw. Yeah. And. Uh, which was such a different thing than anybody else that West had ever encountered. Yeah. West was uh, paper and books and, and reports, and that was it. And, uh, I probably shouldn't uh, mention this, but I'll make a pitch, because Bill Lindbergh, like yourself, is included in our oral history. Mm. And in his uh, conversation, he talked about the development of Westlaw within the company and some of the, you know, decision-making process. Uh, Dwight Opperman, who was the president of the company, was quite an advocate of going in the direction of Westlaw. Mm -hmm. Westlaw took them. But needless to say, there were others in the executive ranks who didn't see it the same way. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting uh, story that he tells, I think. The, um, well, it, because I was in Pennsylvania, I was also involved, met with, talked with the people who were starting uh, what became Lexus. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, do we have time to talk a little bit? Oh about yeah, that? we do. Yeah. Um, there were these two fellows. I think one of them's name was Harvey. I remember most of the. Uh, his favorite drink was uh, Bloody Mary's with lots of <laughs> with a big stick of celery. But um, they were in Pittsburgh, and if you wanted money in Pittsburgh, you tied it to health, and then you got money from Mellon. Mm -hmm. And they had been doing some work on cadavers and checking the laws of the various states. Mm -hmm. And the indexes were a challenge to know what words that they had used, but once they got to the law itself, they all were very much alike, and it occurred to them that if you had the full text, this would be a much easier thing to do. Yeah. And uh, so they started in to think about using full text, mm -hmm. and they um, got the funding and converted the Pennsylvania statutes, with so codified statutes, into machine-readable form. I remember talking to uh, a salesman for microfilm, and he uh, said, oh, but the, the, they'll never be able to have enough memory for all of that, <laughs> poor soul. <laughs> well, times have changed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He became obsolete. His business became obsolete. That's right. But uh, it was an interesting process, and then uh, this they finally moved over and became Old Bar in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And NCR was 
bought a small company because they wanted the company's patents on a certain ink. And this company came complete with this one line on its spreadsheet, or whatever it was, that said, uh, legal database, $8,000. Mm. And that's how they acquired Lexis. So that was the old OBAR with a little bit like the Pennsylvania statutes, yeah. but this is when, what was it Mead Data that became, was the new company? Or, uh, yes. Uh, or was that later, you remember? Well, yeah, it became in... Because that was a paper company at one point that owned yes, and this was, Lexus, in addition yeah, to its other business. That may be what the NCR bought that was yeah, part of Mead Data. That must have been how that all came and about. And it came around and got into... Yeah. And so, uh, and then they, you know, this eight thousand dollars they they sold for billions, or some unbelievable amount of money when they finally. Moved so on. the eight thousand was what you would pay to acquire this product to sell. That was the product. That oh, was their. Oh, I misunderstood. I thought well, that must be what it, they were trying to charge lawyers in those no, days, or something. No, that was the whole thing. Wow. So imagine what their capital gains was. <laughs> oh, I imagine that. But the U.S. government would love that. <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting story. Uh -huh. Well, you were part of the profession then during a time of tremendous change as the computers and everything else came in, and microfilm along the way, <laughs> and then sort of it faded uh, in a way. Um, but you mentioned that OBAR, Lexus, started with full text, and that's, mm -hmm. of course, my memory as well, but the Westlaw at the time was mostly just its head notes, and uh, it was an index, to, but you still needed the books. And, they, they, uh, that yeah, was they, one of the differences for a while, short while. Yeah, they uh, were very proud of their uh, annotations mm -hmm. on the reporters, up, and so that was what they uses their database. Mm. Well, that was interesting. Now, you've already alluded to, uh, you know, some of the work you did with AELL, and I know you were active in other organizations like the American Bar Association uh, in connection with uh, accreditation of law schools, among other things, and I think in the Association of American Law Schools group as well. Um, you know, in effect, Jane, you're one of the few actually in our profession and who can I think legitimately be described as a very broad-based and, and uh, major leader in the profession. And I'd love to ask you to tell us a little bit about some of that aspect of your uh, professional life. Some of the things you did, you've already mentioned uh, you were what, five years as secretary for a, ALL at yes. a time when that was a very different job than right. the secretary has today. Uh, the uh, I was on almost every committee that was an AALL, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things that uh, not only was the profession changing in the way of computers, but also at the time that I was active, which was, mid was president in the mid-1970s, law firms were beginning to explode. And suddenly there were a lot of law firm librarians. Mm -hmm. Up until that time, there'd been very few. And they um, to order to get themselves to the convention, they had to be attached to something. So they all wanted to be on the law library. Private Libraries Committee. Mm -hmm. We ended up with 90 people. <laughs> and 90 people is not a committee. No. It's, it's, a, it's a section, yes. I decided, mm -hmm. and followed the Special Libraries Association. And so while I was president, I initiated the idea of having sections within the Law Library Association. Um, I asked Roger Jacobs and some other committee members to... Uh, write us some bylaws for this. And while it didn't happen while I was president, it happened very shortly afterwards mm -hmm. that we got the sections. And then when we got sections, we suddenly had 
more than we had competing programs up until that time there'd only been one program that's right every two mm -hmm. time and the program was a, you could put in your pocket and now it's there are these competing programs and it's a very big production mm -hmm. but it it started with that and mm -hmm. uh i had no idea and i don't think anybody else did how essential this became it's, it's, uh, for many people their section is really aall yeah well, as you say, it's like type of librarians are those with fairly similar interests in their work. And so the special interest sections have basically become, I guess, as you, as you say, the, the association's sort of front office for those people. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, the technical services people, for instance, who had no real engagement with any of the things that we had for programs mm -hmm. and um, now the met and of course cataloging has uh, the computers changed cataloging mm -hmm. greatly and so they, they did have need to be able to talk to each other yeah. and make the contacts so that they could talk during the year. I remember my early years I went back just before your presidency that year and the number of people that came to the meeting were relatively modest compared mm -hmm. to today. Uh, you know, 300, 400 people was a big meeting. And as I remember, a lot of them were uh, directors or law librarians or whatever the title at the time was, and uh, be it of the academic schools mm -hmm. or uh, maybe some court librarians, state law librarians, um, few from the private law sector, but uh, you didn't have a lot of the uh, the middle level physicians represented uh, at the annual meeting. Most people didn't come, uh, the catalogers or the mm -hmm. assistant catalogers. So you saw that change with the uh, SISs coming mm -hmm. in to help, I guess. Mm -hmm. That must have been an interesting achievement when you look back, because that yeah. was a major change in the structure. Oh, it was. And one I think that's tremendously benefited uh, everybody. Well, it was because, as I say, the private librarians were the impetus that I felt, mm -hmm. but it certainly helped the various other people, the court librarians, mm -hmm. who uh, were a few and far between. Yeah. Well, I remember some years ago you had sort of gravitated up the ladder from that level, in a sense. I was president the presidency of the association, and during that era, I was the representative of AELL to the uh, American Bar Association section on legal education, mm -hmm. and you were part of that, and part of that process there. And I remember uh, the work that uh, you were involved in, and I got to participate in sort of from the side there, yeah. and occurred in uh, standards, uh, uh, writing standards for law schools and specifically the library standards. The um I got involved with that, uh, well, I think Marion Boner from the University of Texas and knew Millard Rudin, who was, mm -hmm. had been the professor at Texas and then was the, the um, executive director of AALS, the Law mm -hmm. School Association. and. Um, he asked me to be on the board, or he got me nominated to the board of AALS. It was to fill in a for someone who had resigned. So I was actually on just a little over a year. Mm -hmm. But uh, and Betty Price was also on for a year, or I th she had a full term at AALS. But I think that was the end of it. Oh. Uh, and then I also was had started with knowing Miller Brood, I started he started getting me assigned to site visitation committees mm -hmm. and I I did a site visit usually two site visits a year until oh a few years after I retired mm -hmm. 
So a lot of law schools. <laughs> a lot of reports to write. <laughs> a lot of reports. I was sort of the, the expert on the new law, the new schools. And uh -huh. So I did a lot of new libraries. And um, that got me onto the uh, section of legal education. Well, I was became a member of the accreditation committee for the section of legal education for some period and chaired it at one point. Then I moved on and was on the standards committee. And um, I was on it about the time that the, uh, the Bar Association itself became interested in standards and uh, had a major revision. Mm -hmm. That was about the time I was moving out of the and uh, I moved, so that went off, to, was on the accreditation committee, the standards committee, and, and the member of the, what do they call it, the section, the, of people who were part of the section, and uh, ran through those, and that was the end of my official, as I say, but I, Still, did continued to do a lot of the uh, work on uh, accreditation. At the well, I find schools. it fascinating that you continued doing site inspections uh, even after your retirement. Uh, I know that some of our colleagues have, but yeah. uh, the uh, I stopped doing it when I it's, it's, I felt that I wasn't keeping up with where people were with technology, uh -huh. and uh, so I decided that. Uh, time for me to move on, let somebody else do it. Mm -hmm. But so far as I know, I'm the only person who was on the AALS Executive Board, the Section of Legal Education's Board, and, AAL, AA, and the Law Library Association. Yeah, that's my understanding that the, that combination of experiences, unique and maybe <laughs> just to you, or very close to that. Yeah, yeah that's right. You've also had some other interesting sounding uh, little additional things. You were a uh, um, library fellow to the National Bar Association Library in Monrovia, Liberia. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about how that all happened and what that was about? Well, um, first, you have to have a little background. Okay. Um, Milton Convents was a member of the Cornell Law Faculty and also a member of the faculty of the Industrial and Labor Relations School mm -hmm. at Cornell. It's also the first person who taught a course in civil rights. Civil rights. And, um, but before that, he had in, I think about 1951, mm -hmm. sailed to Liberia with his family and was there for a year to codify the laws of Liberia. And um, up until he arrived, each lawyers, various lawyers in the Liberia, each had a copy of, they had a copy of this law and he had a copy of that law and somebody else a copy of the others. Mm -hmm. And this was their claim to fame. You had to go to these people if you wanted that. Mm -hmm. So they, but the president of Liberia wanted this stuff consolidated. So Milton went and got these various lawyers to give him access to the, the laws that they had. Mm -hmm. And then he consolidated them, codified them, um, or rewrote them. And in fact, the, the criminal law of Liberia is very similar to the criminal law of the state of New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and he worked on that project until Sergeant Doe shot his friends, mm -hmm. and he'd had nothing more to do with it. But we at Cornell were still getting questions about librarian law because of, they had published three or four volumes of the codification. The rest of it was never published because he, he wouldn't publish until the legislature had passed the codifications he was proposing. Mm -hmm. And so I was... The, Dean Ansi wanted to do something different for a while, and the American Library Association had this program 
which was underwritten by the U.S. Information Agency. And uh, they wanted somebody to help establish a national law library in Liberia. Mm -hmm. And because of this connection from Cornell, it, it seemed like a nice thing for me to do. Uh, and so I applied for it. They were very surprised because they didn't usually get experienced people for these projects. But um, so I was there. I was there for three months. I went the first of January and came back the thirty-first of March. Mm -hmm. And um, the library was set up in the what had been the first presidential mansion. Not much of a mansion. It was, just, <laughs> it was but it was an historic building. It was yeah. well built, uh, brick. Yeah, two stories. Uh, so the, the uh, weight of the books wouldn't make it collapse, I trust. <laughs> the, yeah, the book, books wouldn't make it collapse, but nobody gave them any advice about how to build bookcases, and so they had made them out of cheap wood oh. uh, and five-foot shelves. Oh. They <laughs> <laughs> must have sagged in the middle. <laughs> they sagged and they fell. Yeah. So when I got there, there was they had hired somebody who came in and he was putting braces in the middle of each <laughs> each one of them. And the law li the USIA librarian for the area of Africa, she covered just several countries. She had she'd come up in, before I got there in the summer and the books were all covered as mold. Mm. I imagine it's a, is it a humid climate? Yeah. Well, in the summer, it, it rains and rains. Oh, and I, yeah. it, someone who had been there and said, that, you know, they didn't believe how much it rained, so they looked, put a bucket out one night and came in the next morning <laughs> and it was full. Oh, wow. And um, so the humidity was impossible yeah. in the summertime. And so while I had been told I wouldn't have air conditioning, they had to put in their air conditioning to me to, so you could read the backs of the books that they yeah. just, were just so covered with mold. And uh, I was there in the winter, and the winters are dry, and what we had was all the dust blowing in from the Sahara Desert. But uh, it's not nearly as hard to deal with as the humidity. Mm -hmm. But I, they had bought a number of books. Um, a lot of lawyers co-op sets um, mm -hmm. and others. And so I went in and um, they had reporters and we created a library out of it. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, and I trained a native librarian to, uh, to run it after I left. And I also uh, consulted with the librarian at the Liberian Law School, the University of Liberia's Law School. Mm -hmm. One of the things I did for her was to get the Cornell Library to send us an old copy of the uh, LC classification mm -hmm. so that she worked with that. Now, um, I'm sure that none of it exists anymore. Mm. It, uh, the absolute chaos that came with the revolution shortly after I left. Mm -hmm. uh, it just destroyed all of that sort of thing. But, and some of people say that's the price of working in the developing country. Yeah. Well, you were there for what, one one time for just a few months? Or? Yeah, I was there once for, th yeah. for three months. And uh, mm -hmm. it was... Uh, and it was very shortly after that that the uh, unrest started. Uh -huh. Even from time to time today, they, they continue to have problems mm -hmm. in that country specifically and in that whole region, I believe. With different yeah, factions yeah. trying to take over. Yes, and uh, the uh, and then of course the, the uh, Ebola hit. Yes. 
And That's of course been fairly current. Uh, yeah, so this, but it's been current, around a while there. It uh, has certainly affected the whole atmosphere there because it's, it was so vicious. Mm -hmm. It still is, I guess, in some places. Yeah. Well, you're still listed in the directory, and, uh, <laughs> um, which is interesting. Yep. But, uh, many people after retirement mm -hmm. do not continue in the association, mm -hmm. but they get dropped from the directory, so I won't tell them if you don't. <laughs> I found the, uh, it very useful to find Well, one of address. the things is that, as you know, in academic libraries, mm -hmm. membership is paid by the school, yes. by the law school, and so they're not accustomed to it. I mm -hmm. personally, I never campaigned for it, but I really wonder whether the association shouldn't do, give you more than a plaque when you do an honor like this, like maybe free mm -hmm. membership. It'd be nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, well, that's all, those are they, the, they give you a discount. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, you know, that's the plaque stuff is one of the things that yeah. didn't move when I moved to Florida. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I also understand that because uh, I was involved in the leadership when budgets were not balanced mm -hmm. as they were in your era, and we had to rebalance them. And one of the things we did, uh, the association hired a cost accountant, uh, mm -hmm. the executive director did at the time, and figured out what it really cost to service each different type of member. And the retirees, like you, you or me, if we are members, and, and I am, um, the what we pay essentially covers pretty much just the direct costs associated with uh, servicing the membership, including, you know, the Law Library Journal and the um, Spectrum and some of the things we get. Yeah. And all the mailings, yeah. Yeah, all the mailings. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Jane, um, We've talked about your role in the association and in the profession and some interesting times <laughs> that you were part of it. Um, uh, but we're nearing the end of today's uh, conversation, and i like to ask if there's anything that we have not talked about that you uh, would like to mention at this point. No, I, I think I've uh, covered all the things I was interested in. I, was, I wanted to talk about the sections Mm -hmm. The or, origin of that. And it was, the yeah. I guess the other thing that I have done was I was on, as I say, lots of committees. But I was the biggest committees were the um, connected with the director, the executive director of the association, mm -hmm. and uh, I was on the committee that decided that, that recommended that the first director contract not be renewed. And then I was interviewed on the committee that interviewed for the next successor. Mm -hmm. So that I had a, a piece of that going on as well. Well, you stayed active behind the scenes then <laughs> for quite a few years because yeah. so that was a well after your presidency when uh, you know, that so, was happening. Yeah, those, those things were well right, you know, yeah. much later. And the other uh, thing that I did that I guess we haven't mentioned was that I was uh, on the advisory committee for the government printing office. Oh. And that, um, I think there was a law librarian on it before me, and I don't know whether there still is or not, but uh, that, that was an interesting assignment to... Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Henke was the one who was instrumental in getting it possible for a law library to be a depository library as well as the university library. Mm -hmm. There could be two on one campus. Yeah. That was a big achievement. Yeah, uh, he, he worked yeah. hard on it, and Raymond Taylor also picked up that. Well, I remember Raymond. He, uh, he was in South Carolina, I think. One of the Carolinas. Yeah, as state librarian, and then yeah. eventually and, became superintendent of documents uh, up in D.C. <laughs> But he, uh, well, he was involved, mm -hmm. pushed for this, and um, it was a, a very nice, it wasn't nice, it was an important thing for mm -hmm. the law libraries. And 
but that was a, the committee made recommendations, and the one that I remember because I was the, the first meeting I attended was, you know, why can't you put on the depository libraries the preliminary print of the Supreme Court? And the, the then superintendent of the documents looked at it and he said, well, yeah, we could, we published that. And later I had a, a public librarian come up to me and say, what's the preliminary print? <laughs> And you know, if you don't have the preliminary print, you don't get an opinion for three years. That's right. They were uh, and the anything but swift in publishing the official reporter. The yeah, well, and the preliminary Court. print at least six months, but it's yeah. better. And for the public library, or it relies on that, they're a long way out of date. Yeah. So that was one of my accomplishments. In there. That would be interesting. It's interesting also to note that the, um, I think she still is, uh, the superintendent of documents, um, Mary Alice Beige, mm -hmm. uh, was our assistant Washington Affairs representative mm -hmm. uh, just a few years ago and got involved with, again with the superintendent of documents office and uh, followed by several in between uh, mm -hmm. Raymond as, uh, yes, as Taylor because as superintendent of documents. At the last, uh, convention I attended, I think it was the one in St. Louis, um, the su then superintendent of documents was there and he was one of the people I knew from this committee. Mm -hmm. That they, they tend to p pull people out of this committee that they have been active. And mm -hmm. We met one time in New Orleans and I got the key to the city of New Orleans and I brought that down with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of a fun place always <laughs> yeah. to meet in those days. I, I, any other city I probably wouldn't have bothered, but New Orleans yeah. was... Well, any other city, I don't think you'd get a key. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you would have gotten one. It yeah. wouldn't be quite as interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I certainly have enjoyed talking with you this afternoon, Jane, and I want to thank you, uh, not only on my behalf, but on behalf of uh, uh, the others who are associated with uh, our project. and. Uh, today and uh, for taking time this afternoon to uh, talk about your rather interesting uh, involvement in the profession okay. over many years and it's all the changes and that sort of thing. Nice to reminisce once in a while yeah. with somebody who understands. <laughs> well, of course, if anybody who's watched very many of these knows, I thoroughly enjoy the opportunity to come around and reconnect with uh, colleagues I've known for a long time. And you're certainly in that category. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.